Um, so they say, I don't know who they is, but they say that money talks. Um, and so if money could talk and if your money did talk, what would it tell you? What would it tell you? Would it say something like save me or spend me or use me or invest me or give me or whatever? I mean, what, what would your money say to you? Have you ever thought about that before? It's kind of a funny thing. And, and if we were to assume that your money actually were for you, which is kind of interesting to think about, but if your money were for you, what would your money tell you? What instructions would your money give you? Have you ever thought about those things? If it were for us, what would it say? Now, what I think is interesting, and we're kind of beginning this new series about three things that money would tell us if it could talk to us. What I think is interesting is that the things that money would say to us actually parallel really closely to what Jesus did say to us because he is for us, just as if we could imagine that our money is for us. And um, the thing that we're going to uncover, and, and it's something that's a little bit uncomfortable, and it's probably going to be uncomfortable for you, and it's uncomfortable for me. And, and if you feel uncomfortable about it, just realize that the person sitting next to you probably probably feels uncomfortable too, so we can just all be uncomfortable together, right? Um, But the thing that we're going to discover is that the way most of us handle money is a reminder that there's something wrong with us. (laughs) Because most of us, when we think about the way we handle money, we've got some regrets with it, and we've done some things with it that probably money would tell us we shouldn't have done with it, and yet we did it anyway. And so it's just a reminder that there's something wrong with us, and so we're going to talk a little bit about that. Now, the good news is you showed up on Money Sunday, right? And you're super excited about being here, and it's really uncomfortable because we always get nervous when the pastor talks about money because we, we feel like the preacher's just out to get our money, right? So if you feel uncomfortable, just be glad you're not in my shoes, right? Okay, because, um, you know, I get the fun of delivering a message. But here's something that most pastors don't tell you, but it's absolutely true, that Jesus talked more about money than he did about heaven. Jesus talked more about money than he did about heaven. There are approximately 38 parables Jesus taught, and I say approximately because sometimes people consider, like, statements as parables, but whatever, about, about 38. And of those 38, um, 16 of them were about money, which means that about 40% of Jesus' parables were about money. Now, can you imagine if 40% of my sermons were about money? (laughs) You wouldn't be showing up anymore. You'd be like, hey, that's all he talks about. So so what's interesting, though, is that as much as Jesus talked about money, and again, this is something that, that most pastors would never tell you, he never asked for it. He never asked for it. In fact, there's only one time where Jesus asked somebody for a coin, at least that we're aware of, and when the person gave him the coin, he used it as an illustration, and then he gave it back afterward. (laughs) So Jesus never actually asked people for money, but he talked about it a whole bunch. And so it kind of begs the question, what was his angle? What was his deal? Because the thing I've discovered about Jesus is that he was incredibly um, intentional and purposeful behind what he did and what he said. And so the question is, why Why did Jesus talk so much about money if he never actually asked for it? Why was he so concerned about discussing this somewhat uncomfortable topic? Maybe it's because he had something for us and he was concerned about something so much bigger than money. Jesus always had a purpose. So we're going to talk about three things that money would tell us and how they really parallel what Jesus did tell us, you know, when he did speak. And the first one that our money would, the first thing rather that our money would tell us is this, that I can add meaning to your life, but I'm not the meaning of life, right? I can add meaning to your life, but I'm not the meaning of life. And you get that. I mean, we, we get that. And the reason we know that is because money gets very little airtime at funerals, does it? I mean, people rarely talk about money at funerals. And when they do talk about money, it's not a good thing because it's usually along the lines of he And I use the intentional pronoun he because it's usually not the ladies. It's usually the guys who have this problem. But it's he cared so much about his money. And it's usually in a bit of a bitter tone or an angry tone because the thing was so clear that 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 person who died cared more about money than he or she, but usually he, did about even people. And the thing is that if you make money an end, you may end up alone. Because people who have made money kind of the purpose of their lives, they end up not having people around because the thing that they've communicated to everyone else is, I care more about my money than I do about you. And I care more about my money than I do about people. And so those people just usually end up without very many people surrounding them. And it's just not a very happy situation. But the thing is that when money becomes a means to an end, that's when it actually becomes meaningful. Because being a means to an end is what makes 
anything meaningful. That's what it means to have meaning. That you are not the end, but there's something for which you are used that is the end. It's really a discussion of purpose. And that's really what Jesus was getting at, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that this morning, that, that if you and I want to live a life that is meaningful, we have to learn how to be a means to an end rather than simply being an end. Because, and this is a little bit you know, hard to hear maybe if, if um, your mama told you you're, you're special, and you are, um, but, but the, truth is, the truth is we all have a limited amount of time on life. You're unique just like everybody else, right? Um, so we all have a limited amount of time in life. When you think about the expanse of the world, you know, how long the, the world's been in existence. If you're a young earth person, 8 to 10,000 years. If you believe in evolution, 4.5 billion years or whatever it is. But whatever you want to consider, think about all the men and women who have come through the ages and all the lives that they lived, and then think about the 70 to 80 years you make up. What percentage of all the life being lived that makes up? It is like a blip. It is like a pinprick on, a, on, on the radar screen of humanity. And again, that doesn't mean that you're insignificant. That just means that your time here is limited. And so we have an opportunity to make our lives a means rather than simply an end. Because if all we are is an end, then we haven't lived for very much, have we? Because at some point in time, we're going to be gone, and the people, our kids are going to be gone, and, you know, whatever, the world's going to keep turning, and, and the things that we ended up spending our life on that were us are kind of small, and they're kind of insignificant. But when you decide to be a means to an end, your money becomes a means rather than an end as well. And that is an important place to be because we realize that money becomes a tool. It's not something for us to accumulate and hoard, but it's something to be used for a purpose that is bigger than and greater than ourselves. Now, that's what Jesus talked about in one of his absolutely most confusing parables <laughs> that I can find in any of the Gospels. And so if you're kind of new to Bible study and you, and you haven't looked at the parables before, just so you know what a parable is, it was really a story with a purpose. And in the story, Jesus was generally trying to teach something about the kingdom of God. Kingdom of God isn't really a place, so to say. Um, it's more of the ways of God. So when you hear the kingdom of God, think about the ways of God and the things that God does. And so as Jesus talked in this parable, he was speaking to his disciples, not the 12 apostles, but to all of his followers. So if you're here today and you consider yourself a follower of Jesus, he has something to tell us about the purpose of our lives and being a means to an end that isn't ourselves. And if you're not a follower of Jesus and you, you know, you're just kind of here because somebody dragged you here, um, I just want you to know this may not necessarily apply to you, but I want to invite you to lean in anyway. One, because the parable is just kind of funny and interesting and confusing, all mixed in together. But then two, it may speak to something in you that you didn't know was in you. And it may speak to something where God may be drawing you to see something that you weren't able to otherwise see. And so he tells this parable, and one last one last point is that whenever we read a parable, generally um, one person is God and one person is us. And so as we go through this, you may want to try and figure out who's he talking to, who's, who's God and who's us. Okay, so Luke chapter 16, verse 1, it's a great parable, so confusing. He says, Jesus told his disciples, this is Luke who recorded it for us, Luke who went back and investigated and wanted to give a detailed account. He said, Jesus told his disciples there was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. Now, when Jesus started this way, everybody in the audience knew, oh, this is like a once upon a time story. This isn't a real thing. This is a parable. Jesus is telling us a story because he wants to teach us something. And in this story, there's this very, very, very wealthy man. And this very, very, very wealthy man has so much that he can't even manage it all. So he decides that he's going to give some of it to somebody else. He's going to hire somebody else to manage it for him, right? And if you have a retirement account, you can relate, okay? So that, that's probably almost all of us, right? I mean, so, so we can relate to that. And so word gets to him, uh, and we don't know how, whether it was gossip of the town or friends had come and talked to him, but word somehow gets to him that, hey, your, your manager is misusing your funds and you may want to do something about it. So, verse 2, he called him in. And he asked him, what is this I hear about you? 
I mean, word on the street is you're doing deals on the side, you're mismanaging. I mean, what's going on? So he says, give an account of your management because you cannot be my manager any longer. You are fired. You are fired. And so what I want you to do is clean up the books and give them to me because you're done here. Your time is over. Now, if you're the manager, you're thinking to yourself, oh, he found out. <laughs> Uh-oh, <laughs> you know, I didn't know that this day was coming, and now I've got to figure out what to do because I'm going to find myself very soon out of a job. So, um, verse 3, the manager said to himself, this is, uh, or he said to himself, what shall I do now? And now being a really key word, now is a really key word. He says, my master is taking away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig, and I'm ashamed to beg. I'm I'm kind of an inside guy. I don't do the outside hard labor. I'm ashamed to ask for money. But the problem is word's gotten around, right, that I'm very dishonest. So who's going to hire me at this point? I've got a problem on my hands. I've got to figure out what to do. But see, he says, I've got a little bit of time, and I've got a little bit of opportunity. What shall I do now? I've got a little bit of time. I've got to figure out what to do. I've got a little bit of opportunity. He says, I know what I'll do. So that when, because it's all about timing, when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. And what this manager does, and if you've heard this parable before, I mean, just remember, when Jesus first told this, it was so confusing and it was so strange and it didn't make any sense, but that's what made Jesus the master storyteller because people were listening and they're leaning in and they're saying to themselves, what? I mean, did, did that, what kind of story is this, Jesus? I mean, but, but it's so, so special because what this man realizes is that he has to make a plan. He has to come up with something to do because he has just a little bit of time and he has a little bit of opportunity and he's got to figure out what do I do with this time and this opportunity because I need somewhere to go and I need someone to go to. I need somebody who's going to welcome me because I'm about to lose it all. So he called in, verse 5, each one of his master's debtors. Now, the implication is he called in all of them, but Jesus is going to give us examples of two of them. So he called in all of his master's debtors, and he asked the first, how much do you owe my master? 900 gallons of olive oil, he replied, which is kind of a lot of olive oil. So the manager told him, I don't know what you do with 900 gallons, but the manager told him, take your bill and sit down quickly. Key word again, quickly, time is of the essence. We got a little bit of opportunity and a little bit of time and we need to do something about it. So here's what we're gonna do. Sit down quickly and make it 450. Now that's a pretty good deal, isn't it? How many of you, if Visa or Discover or GM Financial Services called you up and said, hey, we decided to cut your bill in half, you'd be like, hallelujah, right? I mean, that's what I am looking for. That is so great. And so there are some people in this audience who are like celebrating. They're like, oh, that's great. I wish I could win the lottery like that. And then other people in the audience are kind of ticked off, right? Because they're thinking, that's scumbag. I mean, he just totally misused. He is a crook. No wonder he's getting fired because he is, uh, he is terrible. He is so dishonest and he's misusing this money. And I can't wait to see what happens when the master finds out because he's going to have to turn those books in and he's going to find out that moron's going to be thrown in prison. I mean, who knows if he'll be executed as a result of what he's done. I mean, the, you know, Jesus, again, he just had the audience in, in the palm of his hands. Then he goes to the second debtor. Here's what he says. He says, um, um, then he asked the second, and how much do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat, he replied. And so he told him, take your bill, make it 800 quickly, do it quickly. See, what he was doing was he was securing a future for himself. He was taking the time and the opportunity that he had available to him, and he was using it to the best of his ability. And the implication is this master, I mean, he had so many resources, obviously he could hire a manager to take care of all them, so potentially there were dozens, if not hundreds of people who owed all of this, and he goes to every single one of them, (laughs) and he reduces their bills. And in doing so, he makes himself the best friend of every debtor in town. Because they're thinking, hey, you know, you're you're my buddy, you just saved me all kinds of money, I like this guy. So the master, we read, The master who found out, the master who should be enraged by what he's discovered, (laughs) the master, he confused his audience, Jesus did, so that they'd pay attention. The master commended 
the dishonest manager. Now, is that the word you would use if you were Jesus telling the story? Slapped him silly. I mean, you know, no, no, no. The master commended the manager. He patted him on the back. He says, you got me again. I knew you were a low bag. You know, I knew you were a scumball, but you did even, you, you know, fool me once, shame on me. You fooled me twice, shame on me, whatever. I mean, how, how, I can't believe I let you do this to me again. You got me. You got me. He says the master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. It's like, huh? The guy was a crook. He was a total crook. And Jesus, in telling this story, says, no, 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 he was shrewd. Do you know why? Because he had a little bit of time and a little bit of opportunity, and he recognized he could do something with it. I mean, isn't that true for us? When we recognize we've got a little bit of time and a little bit of opportunity, don't we do something unique with it? Remember, those of you who are out of high school, do you remember your senior year in high school? And you had a little bit of time and a little bit of opportunity. You're going to figure out what to do with that. Or my favorite, as I was thinking about this, is before you have a baby, you've got a little bit of time and a little bit of opportunity, especially that last week, because it's a lot easier to carry that baby around when they're inside than when they're outside, and you've got a little bit of time. You want to leverage it for the best, you, best thing you can. Or when you move somewhere else, and that last week before you move, you're thinking, man, I've got people to see. I've got a little bit of time. I've got to prioritize. I've got a little bit of opportunity. I've got to do something with it. Or you get the diagnosis and you realize your days are numbered. What do you do? You, you've got a little bit of opportunity and a little bit of time. What are you going to do with it? That's what this manager recognized. He had a little bit of time and a little opportunity, and he found a way to leverage it because he knew the end was near. And then Jesus finished his parable, and he kind of pulled out of it, and he gave the... the, the um, he gave the kind of summary, summation, summary of it. Here's what he said. He said, for the people of this world, the people of this world, those who live as if all there is to this life is this life, the people of this world, and, and, and you know, there are still people today who live as if all there is to this life is this life. He says, the people of this world are more shrewd they're more thoughtful in judgment. They're, they're more um, considering of the future. They're more intelligent. They're more wise in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. Now, conceptually, Jesus is talking about the Jewish people, but I think it expands on to those who were his followers and his disciples, which if you call yourself, again, a follower of Jesus, this kind of applies to us. But essentially what he's saying is that those who see life as a birth certificate and death certificate and all that's in between, They tend to be more careful than those who realize that there's more to this life than this life. Those who realize that there is actually an eternity, that there is a future beyond our death certificate. But they lose sight, they lose sight of the future. And so those who are temporary are more shrewd with what they have than those who are not. And see, the money manager, he was commended for taking full advantage of his limited time and his limited opportunity because he realized right in front of them he had a little bit of time and a little bit of opportunity and he wanted to do something with it. But the people of light who recognize there is eternity, Jesus said, hey, my followers need to do the same. My followers need to do the same because we have limited time and we have limited opportunity. So how do we become a means to an end that is not us? How do we use what has been given to us? How do we leverage what has been entrusted to us for something that goes beyond today? Jesus continued. He says, I tell you, which was a command, and again, this is for his followers. If you're not a follower of Jesus, this doesn't apply to you. But for those of us in this room who call ourselves followers of Jesus, he says, I tell you, use worldly wealth. Let me say it again. Use worldly wealth because it's a means, it's not an end. So it's a tool. Use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves so that when it is gone, not if, when, because it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when, when it is gone, because you can't take it with you, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. And the thing that Jesus was saying in this is that money is a means. Money is a means. 
Money is a means. It's simply a tool. Our earthly resources, and, and I, honestly, I mean, there are pieces of this that I think I understand, but it's so confusing, and, and it's not fully, fully grasped, but he seems to be saying that when we recognize that, if we can use our earthly resources for something that has eternal purpose, that we're going to be commended and recognized for that at some point in the future, and I don't know, again, exactly what that looks like, but his point, and I mean, if Jesus can be trusted, um, and if Jesus is right, and I realize, you know, <clears throat> there are things Jesus says sometimes that make me uncomfortable. There are things that he says that I don't necessarily want to do, but I've never done what he said and lived to regret it. That's just kind of my own deal. And when somebody dies and comes back to life and predicts it all and pulls it off, I tend to believe what they have to say. That's just, <laughs> that's just me. But, but I mean, Jesus, if he's right, he's essentially saying that everything you and I have Everything you and I have been entrusted with, everything that has been placed into our little pot is a tool to be used for his purposes. So the question is, how can I leverage more of what I have as a means to an end that is not me? How can I use it for something that moves beyond me, that moves beyond my kids beyond my family that moves into something that is actually lasting, something that is eternal. Now, I got to tell you where this hits me because it hits me um, in one place in particular. I think it has the potential of hitting us all in a couple of places, and it may hit you in two of those places, but there's one particularly for me that just kind of really gets me, okay? So I'll just be straightforward and transparent about that today. Um, you know, for, for us, for Carrie and I, giving and financial giving, that's never been a problem. We grew up, I grew up believing that I needed to give a tithe, which is 10%. And so ever since high school, I've given 10% of my income to the church. When we got married, I gave 10%. We wasn't even a discussion. In fact, when I meet with premarital counseling with couples who are getting married, we have a discussion. Nobody ever writes this down, so you probably won't either. And nobody's, you know, brains explode, though I think they should. I look at couples and I say, you know what, you're going to live on a percentage of your income. See, nobody wrote that down. Why didn't you write this down? That's, that's money right there. No pun intended, well, pun, pun kind of intended. But you're going to live on a percentage of your income. It will either be less than 100%, or it'll be 100%, or it will be more than 100%, which is pretty much what everybody in America does. You're going to live on a percentage of your income, and so the wisest thing you could do is to pre-decide what percentage that is going to be, and my best recommendation is to make it under 100, okay? I mean, just, just saying, that's my best recommendation, and the thing is that if you don't choose your percentage, your lifestyle will choose it for you, and I can guarantee you the lifestyle is going to always pull you in the direction of over 100%. And so that's a conversation that I have with couples, you know, before they even get married. I just say, you've got to pre-decide. I'm not telling you what that percentage needs to be. You've got to figure that out for yourself. My job isn't, you know, to tell you any of that. I'm just encouraging you. You need to have that conversation as you take that into play in your financial decisions. So anyway, Carrie and I, you know, we're kind of on the same page with that. And then uh, when I was in my late 20s, I got to go to a conference, and Rick Warren was there speaking. He's a megachurch pastor, Saddleback Church out in California. He wrote a little book called The Purpose Driven Life. I don't know if you've ever heard of that before. But he wrote this book for his congregation, and it just went crazy and sold more copies than any other book in history other than the Bible. And so at this conference, he was sharing about how um, money just started pouring in. I mean, checks, they just started coming unexpectedly. And he said, we had more money than we knew what to do with. And so at this conference he was sharing, he said, my wife and I, we decided to become reverse tithers, that they would keep 10% and give away 90%. And he went back and he paid back the church every penny the church had ever paid him when he was working there for salary. And when he speaks places, he pays for his own honorariums. He pays for his flights and hotels and everything. He won't charge anybody a penny because they have so much. And he said, we didn't upgrade our house or our car. We just decided to give away and to use what we have as a means to an end that's not us. And when I heard that, it was so inspirational. And I went to Carrie and I realized, you know, that's a little overwhelming, especially if you give 50 bucks a week or 50 bucks a month or 50 bucks a year, or nothing, you know, whatever. And so to hear 90%, giving away 90%, how do you ever do that? 
But Carrie and I, we, we talked about it. We said, okay, we're just going to steadily increase our giving above 10%. I know, crazy. And so we're just going to do that. And so that, that's just never been hard for us. Giving our money away has never been hard for us. But do you know what's hard for me? And this is kind of, I'm just being real vulnerable here. We had a sermon on confession a couple weeks ago, which you're never supposed to do in public, but I'll do it now. Um, what's hard for me, and it's not hard for her because of her upbringing, but it, what's hard for me is stuff. I love my stuff. In that video, the Amazon box that comes to your door and you have no idea what's inside, it's like a dopamine hit every time. And I love stuff, and we have so much stuff. I mean, our basement is full of crap. That what are you ever going to do with all of this stuff? And I think to myself, well, I might need it. I mean, there could be a rainy day, or I mean, it'd have to be a monsoon that I would actually need it. I, I, and I think, well, if we move to another house, or there could be a day when, or a day if, and you know, I've just got to save it, and it's down there, you know, gathering dust. And that's what we Americans like to do, don't we? We put it in our basement, or we put it in our attic, or a storage unit. Did you know that we have so many square feet of storage units in the United States that there's enough for every single, think about this, every single American to have seven square feet. That's overwhelming, isn't it? What are we doing with all this stuff? I mean, really. And then, you know, it, it, I've heard that if you were to take the amount that Americans consume and waste, and if everybody on our globe consumed and wasted as much as Americans consumed and wasted, it would take 4.2 Earths to sustain us all. We have so much stuff. And I, I mean, I'm pointing right here. So back in November, Carrie and I had a conversation, and this was a conversation that I facilitated, not hers, so she didn't, to her benefit, she didn't come to me and bring this up. I just said, we got to get rid of stuff. And by we, I mean I. <laughs> I've got to get rid of stuff. We've, I, I've, we've got to change this. And so we made a decision that we're going to start trying to turn stuff into stories. We want to turn stuff into stories because we don't want to just hoard stuff and gather up stuff. We want to begin using our stuff as a tool. And so we made a decision that if there were opportunities that would come our way and we became aware of things and we had something that could bless somebody else, because what's the alternative? We save it up and you could give it to the, to the rummage sale for India. That would be a great thing to do with it. But you, you have a garage sale. What do you do? Make a couple bucks and spend a lot of hours doing it and then buy more stuff with it? I mean, what's the point of that? And so we just said, if there's somebody that we can bless with our stuff who could use it and who could be benefiting from it, why are we holding on to it? What is the point of holding on to stuff? And so the thing that I think you absolutely need to consider as you think about your whole kind of financial situation and you need to factor into your financial decisions is, do I want more stuff or more stories? Do I want more stuff or more stories? Do I really just need to accumulate more? Or is it possible that God wants to use what I have as a means to an end that is bigger than me? I tell you what, when Carrie and I, I was just kind of standing in the back while we were watching the baptism earlier today, and when we walk into this place and into our church campus in Greensburg, we look at that and we just, we, we smile. I smile. When I come in here every day of the week and I see people meeting and conversations happening and just people being cared for at Amex Well, when I see Sunday morning, sometimes when I'm not speaking, I go down, I look in the kids' classrooms and I see what's going on and I see environments where kids aren't being babysat, but when they're being engaged by loving adults who care so deeply for them and want them to know that there is a God who loves them and who is for them. And they are anchoring the word of God in the hearts of children. And I, my heart just sings. And I just think, what a privilege. What a privilege as I look at these kids engaging spaces. And it's not dark and dingy and paint chipping off the wall anymore. But it's like actually a safe space for our kids. And that, that's a good thing. And when I see people come through the door who have had, like, you know, been turned off by church because of how they were treated. And I see we get these comment cards back. You fill out comment cards. If you're a first-time guest, we ask you to anyway. And, and when they send it back, one of the things we hear is we're, we're friendly. Oh, 
I mean, to think that a church could actually be friendly and that people who follow Jesus would have smiles on their faces rather than frowns. I mean, it's just kind of mind-blowing again. So I just, I just think what a privilege. And when I hear baptism stories and every time I had somebody come up to me at our marriage retreat this weekend and said, you know, I'm going to be baptized and I'm just, what this church has done for me and what it has meant for me, oh my goodness, it's worth far more than my stuff. Far more than my stuff. I wouldn't take back a penny if, if people were offering it back. All the money that I have invested into this place, and it's been a lot, I wouldn't take any of it back because I know that God is using it for something so much bigger than me. And I'm not talking about being irresponsible because, yes, we have three kids to raise and a puppy. I mean, we've got, we've got college maybe and marriage and whatever, weddings and stuff like that and cars that need to be fixed. And, I mean, you know, we've got expenses too. I'm not saying be irresponsible. How can we turn our stuff into stories? Jesus says your money can add meaning to your life, but it's not the meaning of life. It's not the purpose. He went on. He said, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much, and whoever is dishonest with very little will be dishonest with much. This is kind of confusing, but he just kept talking. He said, so, if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? Like, worldly wealth, what are you talking about? And true riches, what's that all about? What are you getting at with this little much talk, Jesus? But what he really was saying is that money is a test. That money is a test. And what we do with what we have is an indication of whose kingdom we are most devoted to. The book-ended kingdom of this earth with life and death or the eternal kingdom of God. He says, and if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? And someone else is like, Jesus, what are you talking about? Someone else's, isn't it mine? Isn't it mine, Jesus? Well, here's the thing. I think if money could talk, it would simply confirm that I'm still here when you're gone. And as soon as you think you own me, I actually own you. Because you can't take it with you. And if you can't take it with you, then who does it belong to? Not you. Now, if you're an atheist and say, you know, I'm just stardust or some miracle of evolution or whatever, you know, I, I don't know how to answer the question for you. Who does it belong to or who are you stewarding it for? Or who are you managing it for? But for those of us who call ourselves followers of Jesus, who believe there's a God who created the world and he put the planets into motion and he created humanity and he gave each one of us a little bit of time on this earth and a little bit of opportunity and he handed us stuff and he said, I want to trust you with this and I want you to use it and leverage it then the question we've got to ask ourselves is, what are we doing with it? What are we doing with it? Money says, I'm a means, I'm not an end, I'm a tool and a test. I can add meaning to your life, but I'm not the meaning of life. Now, this is the point where people kind of check out because preacher's talking about money, and that's always, again, <laughs> it's a little uncomfortable. But the thing I just want to remind you of is I didn't say all this. Jesus did, and he pulled off his own death and resurrection. So I just, you know, look him up. He had some pretty good stuff to say. And, and I think it leads us to an important question that we have to pause and ask ourselves. We have to pause and ask ourselves. And the reason we have to pause and ask it is because we don't generally ask it. And if you never pause to ask it, you'll never, you'll never find yourself asking this question. And it has almost nothing to do with money, and yet it has everything to do with money. And the question is simply this, that if being a means to an end is what gives your life meaning, right? Because again, that's what meaning is. If you're the end of your life, your life doesn't have a whole lot of meaning. If being a means to an end is what gives your life meaning, to what end do you want your life to be a means? If being a means to an end is what gives your life meaning, to what end do you want your life to be a means? What is your purpose? That's really a question of purpose, isn't it? What's your purpose? Why are you here? What do you want people to celebrate about you when you're gone? When they line up at your funeral and they want to talk about you, what do you hope they say? Again, if you don't choose this, your unchecked, uncontrolled desires will choose it for you. And do you know what I know the answer to that question isn't? It's not possessions, it's not crazy, awesome vacations. 
It's not a really good investment portfolio. It's not a basement full of junk. It's not every experience I could possibly come across. It's something so much bigger. But our culture always pulls us toward those things, doesn't it? It says, eat, drink, be merry, and then tomorrow you die. That's what life's all about. But you know what we call that? We call that selfish. And we say that that's a life not very well lived. In fact, dare I say, a life that was wasted. Because you only had a little bit of time and you only had a little bit of opportunity. And if all you did with that little bit of time and little bit of opportunity was spend it on you, I'm not sure it accomplished a whole lot. I'm not sure you were found very faithful or shrewd with what had been entrusted to you. But I'm telling you, until you answer that question, you'll follow your money around wherever it leads you. But once you answer that question, there is something inside of you that will light up as you begin to understand what you were created for. And there is something that will become so passionate within you and you'll realize what you should do with the resources and the things that have been entrusted to you and it will not be solely focused on you. It will be something so much bigger. So take time to answer that question. If being a means to an end is what it means to give your life meaning, to what ends do you want your life to be a means? Jesus or Luke tells us, rather, at the very end, verse 14, the Pharisees, who loved money, heard all this, and they were sneering at Jesus. And do you know what their names were? I don't either. So we're going to pick up there next Sunday. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, wow. Would you help each one of us in this room to understand the purpose of our lives. God, help us not to be so small as to make ourselves the end. But help us to see what you've given us and what you've entrusted to us as opportunity. We all have a limited amount of time. We all have a limited amount of resources. Some of us have more than others. It doesn't really matter. It's what we do with what has been entrusted to us. And so, God, would you help us to take what has been entrusted to us, and to use it for something that has eternal value. God, I pray for the person who's wrestling here who may not know, you know, what they believe about you or even if you're real and they're just kind of struggling with all this, but they know that living for themselves and living for money hasn't really taken them anywhere purposeful. So I just pray that this could be a challenge and an invitation to take a step in your direction. Would you give each one of us wisdom to know what we need to do as we sift through and think through that question, to what end do I want my life to be a means? Why am I here? What, do I, what is my purpose? God, would you help us to work through that and then give us the courage to make whatever course corrections are necessary? Thanks for this time. Thanks for all we've gotten to celebrate today and for the privilege of being in this place. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.